session of Henry George's engagement with the church as uh, uh, exploration in the new annotated works of Henry George, Volume 3. First of all, we got to thank the CGO for putting on this session, and especially Alana for organizing this session. She put a, a lot of work into it. So, so we don't forget, can you please give Alana a big applause? We got some wonderful speakers today, and if you look on, in your program, you can see them. But we're going to have our first session, and it's on the annotated works. And we've got uh, Dr. Jim Dowsey and also Dr. Alex Law here with, with us presenting. And also, by modern technology, we hope to have Fred Fulvery uh, zooming in from California. So he's listening at the present time, and he'll be the third speaker. What we'll do is, um, depending on time, we'll do the presentation. When the speaker is finished, I'll take one or two questions, and then we'll go on to the next speaker, and then at the end, we'll, we'll have a question and answer session. So, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. James Dowsey. He is currently the Wolf Chair and Professor of Religious Studies at Emory and Henry College, Virginia where he has also served as provost and academic D.D. Dr. Dorsey is the author and co-author of several books on theology and social justice, including Peter's Last Sermon, Identity and Discipleship in the Gospel of Mark, Con Confederatos, am I saying that right, Professor? Confeder Confederatos. Yeah, you, fantastic. <laughs> All self-immigrants <laughs> in Brazil, uh, you might recognize from Wasteland to Promised Land, Liberation Theology for Post-Marxist World, and Luke and Voice, Confusion and Irony in the Gospel of Luke. He has also written more than 80 articles in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. Several have focused on the economic teachings of Henry George, including Liberation Theology and Economic Development. This was found in the past, the justice following in the footsteps of Henry George. He was also a presenter at the 2007 Scranton Council of George's Organizations and Robert Schackenbach Foundation Conference. His paper at that conference was titled Human Nature from a G George's Perspective, and that is found in the book at the back, Two Views of Social Justice, a Catholic and George's Dialogue. Dr. Dorsey also enjoys fiction, fiction writing and believes that stories re relay truths not easily encompassed by prose. Quote, we live our lives by stories, Dr. Dorsey claims. It's no secret why Jesus and other great religious leaders were storytellers. Please welcome theologian, philosopher, and storyteller, Dr. James Dowsey. certainly nice to be here and see old friends again. Uh, I'm looking at Walt Ryback and Nick Tiedemann. It's wonderful to see you last night, Ed Dobson. Yes. Many, many friends, old acquaintances. And uh, I'm invited to speak on the new um, book that's just come out. I've received a copy. And I think it's already available for sale. But it's a wonderful volume that was edited by Francis Petal and uh, William Pierce on um, the annotated works of Henry George. And um, my part of this was the volume on social problems. So um, I looked at that. Now I want to say a few words about this. Um, I urge you to, to read, read the book. 
my introduction to this volume uh, focused on how the volume, how social problems came to be, how it was written, why it was written, the historical background that went into that, the context. But then I shifted focus and discussed um, Henry George's influence on the social gospel, which began to arise right, right at that time, after this volume, and his relationship with the great theologian, the Baptist theologian, uh, Walter Rauschenbusch, who is often thought of as the father of the social gospel. And um, so um, uh, I wanted to say a few comments about that. Um, let's see. Uh, could we get uh, my presentation? Mine has a copy of the book as the first slide. Or the cover of the book as the first slide. There, there are eight, uh, 19 slides. <laughs> so we're on the second one already. We're making good time. <laughs> uh, I want to say something about the origin, as I said, uh, of George's book in the few minutes that I have. And so, so let me start, start with that. Um, the origin of social problems grew out of a proposal from Miriam Florence Leslie. And here, trying to get you online. Um, she, she, she changed her name and was called Frank Leslie after, <laughs> after her husband. Uh, and uh, so it, this proposal came in uh, 1883 that George write a series of articles. And uh, these articles, 13 articles, were to be published in Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper. And the whole was to be entitled Problems of the Time. George was to target the non-specialist. Uh, he was to write in a uh, language unencumbered by technicalities and free from abstract reasoning. Um, uh, he was to address. He was to address the social problems. Each article, for each pro article, he was to receive a hundred dollars. Hundred dollars uh, today would be equivalent to something like two thousand three hundred fifty dollars. Um, uh, the next slide. Third slide. Um, Batman? No. Uh, Miriam Florence Lesson. Third slide. That's where we were. Okay. Mir Miriam Lesson. <clears throat> Mir Miriam, uh, Frank, Frank Leslie had died. The husband had died um, in 1880, leaving his publication, um, the Illustrated Newspaper, $300,000 in debt, something like $7 million today in debt. Um, and uh, she was in her mid 40s. She was a widow. Uh, she was um, keeping her head above name. She changed her name, as I suggested. I worked on that. increasing. She worked on increasing the publication of the Illustrated newspaper to 200,000 subscriptions. On the fourth slide. Um, Leslie's plan with George's Problems of the Time series was actually to compete directly with Harper's Weekly, which in January had started producing or publishing articles written by uh, William Graham Sumner. Um, 
Today we remember um, Dr. Sumner as, a, I would say, an outmoded social Darwinist. But in his day, we would have recognized him as one of Yale's more um, well-known professors. He was chair of political economy, and he had uh, something of the father of a brand new discipline, sociology. Um, fifth slide. <clears throat> Forgotten man. Sumner, Sumner was a proponent of um, uh, liberal class of uh, liberal cap capitalism. Uh, something today akin to what we would call a libertarian, I would say. He was influenced by Herbert Spencer. He thought that society, like nature, progressed by the survival of the fittest. That's uh, Spencer's phrase. Uh, some people were superior, uh, others inferior. They separated themselves into classes. He affirmed the individual's freedom to advance his prestige and wealth. Um, some are expressed doubts about charity. Um, people competed to accumulate property, to rise in social class, and that was good for society, he thought. Uh, sixth slide. Sumner coined the phrase, the forgotten man, which is still being used in our society today um, in his lectures. And by that, he was referring to the middle class person who ended up saddled with the cost of relief programs dreamed up by social reformers. Yeah. He praised those working men, some of did, who were self-reliant, persevered through hardship, who being frugal, prudent, and moral were able to lead better lives. Uh, uh, those who were lazy, uh, depraved, foolish, he had little uh, patience. If the uh, profligate life brought misery, and the misery was well deserved, he also believed. Also, um, Sumner could not stand people born with privilege. Um, all 11 of um, Sumner's articles for Harper's were put together into a book and published, um, I, th I think, that uh, very next year, in What Social Classes Owe to Each Other. Uh, that book has gone through at least five publications, many editions and by some it is still um, considered a neglected classic, a classic, a classic book. <clears throat> uh, seventh slide. The seventh slide. Uh, Sumner affirmed land, labor, and capital. Uh, these were all essential to the creation of wealth, but yet unrecognized hero of the tree was capital. We have ourselves, the earth, the things which limit us is really capital, he thought. He thought capital was stored energy, uh, it's accumulated, and uh, he thought few people appreciated its worth. We need it, he thought, the stored energy is what allowed the betterment of society. The creation of um, factories, school, church, hospital, etc. and losers was natural and good. 
uh, the advancement of the fittest benefited society as a whole. Not so for Henry George, as all of us know. Uh, the great divide of the social classes show the failings of modern society. While the property laws and tax laws of the time allowing society's movement towards concentration and perpetuation of wealth might be legal, George considered them unjust. The disparity in wealth, thought George, destroyed liberty, destroyed the environment, life possibilities, and resulted in poverty, sickness, drunkenness, it robbed children of education. Tenth slide. Uh, classical liberalism and Sumner uh, saw American society as fostering rugged competition between individuals. Uh, uh, they would, um, by virtue of hard work, uh, creativity, perseverance, frugality, either succeed or fail. George saw society as structurally flawed, envisioned something better. He thought people lived in communities, they were interdependent. The welfare of one social class affected the other classes. Um, one of his phrases, all people were interwoven into a tapestry. Uh, 11th slide. He's on his oh, sorry. <coughs> Society's paradigm. <coughs> Both writers thought of society as a living organism. Uh, Sumner's model took its key from biological evolution through natural selection. Individuals in society progressed through <coughs> struggle, but the struggle wasn't as for survival as he imagined in nature. Society had progressed, Sumner thought, to the point where men and women struggled for greater comfort and life possibilities. The fittest individuals were those who could maximize economic opportunity um, and uh, do well. George, in comparison, thought of society as working best when it conformed not with the law of the jungle, but with the law of the natural law of God's creation. George's vision of the world was of a storehouse filled with abundant goods, enough to provide for all people and all creatures. To George, there was an intended order of creation. It was a rational order. The creator of the universe had planned a world that would benefit all. Uh, Twelfth slide. Sumner agreed with Herbert Spencer in holding that there were no natural rights, only those enabled by law. Before the tribunal of nature, a man has no more right to a life than a rattlesnake, Sumner wrote. Laws followed, as it were, from culture and custom. They arose as means of maximizing the will of those uh, yielding power. For George, the very foundation for the right to life, liberty, and other human rights rested with the Creator's endowment. The order of creation was rational, could be discerned by the human mind. If living conditions proved unjust, then government must readjust its institutions and laws in order to bring about greater justice. Laws should conform with the rational mind and to the reason of creation, not just power and custom. Slide 13. Of the views that separated George from Sumner, none are more telling than the ways they perceive land and natural resources in general. Of capital, labor, and land, Sumner said, the least about land. He did take up the topic of land briefly in chapter 4 what social classes owe each other, but only to claim that he had little tolerance for schemes of land appropriation and redivision. Sumner recognized that scarcity caused land to increase in value without any additional work on the part of the landowner. As scarcity increased, landowners 
increased what they charged in rent. So the unearned increment from land, especially in view of the large gains of landlords in the old countries, has indeed made the position of an English landowner for the past 200 years the most fortunate of any classes a class mortals has ever enjoyed, Sumner wrote. Uh, he did not oppose tax on land or an inheritance tax, however. Uh, he thought that in America, the increment should go to the pioneer who reduces land to use. Since the unearned increment was to go to someone, it should go, should go to the person who could demonstrate ownership of property, he thought. Uh, moreover, he thought, in America there was plenty of land. There was a large frontier. Um, <clears throat> slide 14. While Sumner seems blind to the consequences of a shrinking frontier, the hoarding of land to the detriment of landless, money made from land speculation, etc., George understood their significance. Sumner's own ideal of American market capitalism could only work fairly if all people enjoyed access to land, George held. If access to natural resources was shut off, the laborer could not work. How could the farmer plant if he had no field? How could the metallurgist forge his product without ore? When examined carefully, all industry and every job ultimately depended on what nature provided. The laborer took the raw materials, crafted them into things that were more useful. But what if deprived of land? What recourse did the worker have? But by a kinder name, that was enslaved. Fifteen. George's divide with Sumner betrayed a more fundamental distinction between Sumner's failure to recognize the disappearance of the frontier, to see the destructive results of land monopolization and speculation are to understand that it was unjust to deprive laborers from natural access to war resources. George and Sumner's divide was deeply philosophical. What was the purpose of creation? Uh, what was the purpose of the natural world? How were humans related to the rest of the creation? Was there a design to creation? And if so, what was it? Uh, 16. Although himself an ordained clergyman, Sumner adopted much of Herbert Spencer's understanding of natural law. The dominant ordering principle of creation, Sumner thought, was evolution. Life moved from the simple to the complex. Although having coined the phrase survival of the fittest and oftentimes being misrepresented as Darwinian, Spencer was actually Lamarckian and mistaken in his understanding of evolution. Spencer thought that biological traits acquired and practiced during an organism's life could be passed down to successors, while on a continuum of all other life, human life represented the culmination of evolution so people could pass down what they inherited from the good habits of their um, ancestors. Uh, slide 17. George's view of the good social order uh, thought that the structures of good society were part of creation. The hand of the beneficent creator was everywhere evident. True, the universe continuously changes in ways similar to a living organism. Our bodies are like a flame of a gas burner, which was as continuous and defined form, but only as a manifestation of change in a stream of succeeding particles, he wrote. Human bodies, like everything else in the universe, are passing manifestations of matter and energy. We get glimpses of the Creator's designing hand when birds construct nests and spiders spin webs. Animals act instinctively in specific ways they were, they were designed to act, and people too are similarly guided by instincts. But the human instincts, when observed, might be said to be inferior to those of other animals. What allows human beings superior to other animals 
are not the abilities of self-defense to find food, but the man is created in the likeness of the old maker, especially in his, her, I would add to George, rational ability. Besides logical abilities, George included in the rational faculties, those abilities to enable humans to become makers and producers. He also included the human mind and spirit and soul, that which feels, perceives, thinks, wills. People can shape their environment. Curiosity leads men and women to seek ways to improve life. They overcome problems, forge improvements, thank you. Obstacles, critical thinking was a special human quality, a gift of the creator. Deciphering consequences, previewing God's consequences gave people the ability to become creators too. Humans have the ability to improve society and make a better world. Uh, slide 18. George viewed these particular economic rights as tied to the law and other natural resources. In George's view, God had created a bounteous earth which was intended to provide more than needed to satisfy all. Nature was a storehouse, and its good could be multiplied manifold through the work and creative ability of people. Slide 19. George thought that God intended that people enjoy creation. As at a festival, the table was set, the world and its fruits were created for the benefit of all. Nature supplied raw materials. George thought that people were created such as they found enjoyment and fulfillment in work. Labor produced the dual benefits of increasing the bounty of God's storehouse while bringing pleasure to the worker who was able to satisfy the needs and those of his family, and at the same time improve for the usefulness of what nature had bestowed. But the enjoyment of the natural world should not to George mind be separated from our commitment and our duty to protect it for ourselves, our neighbors, others whom we might or might not know, and future generations. All should be allowed fair access to the raw materials of nature, the land, air, water, etc. Establishing and safeguarding that opportunity had become George's life. Being a steward of creation meant to enter the fray. Part of the human being, he thought, included seeking justice. And to seek justice started with proclaiming and keeping God's intention for creation that all be allowed reasonable opportunity to nature's storehouse. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, James. We'll take one question, and with the question, we. We keep it, we don't make a comment, just ask a simple question, and we'll take two questions. With that, Ed. Jim, I've always had some concerns about Henry George's use of the term natural law as prescriptive versus merely descriptive. As a philosopher, where do you come down on that issue? And in my, my second talk today, I want to talk about my path by which I reached Henry George. I reached Henry George through my Christianity, through my religious heritage, I would say. So I came to, to Henry George as a philosopher first, introduced by, uh, by my good friend, Bob Anderson. And so um, with, with Bob, uh, I believe that um, human nature were sinful and were actually depraved creatures. That, uh, I don't mean that we don't have lots of good in us, but that we have many, many failings. Uh, sometimes by omission, and somebody, sometimes by intention. So I think of it as, as sin. And uh, that's, that's the human nature. And um, so I think God, um, I'm giving my answer as a, as a human being, I guess. I think God ordered the universe. He, he 
what God created was good. I agree with St. Augustine that evil is actually the absence of the absence of God. Right? Like darkness and the absence of light. And so there's a there's an ordered universe. When we're thinking correctly, when we're using our rational mind, we can see this. But we don't always see it. You know, many of us delude ourselves. Our, our greed gets in the way. So I think there's natural law. We're not always, we don't always order our lives toward it. Okay? We do what's irrational. Does that happen? Sure. And uh, thank you very much again. Could we have a person on the audio board, please? Uh, thank you uh, very much again. It's, it's my pleasure to um, present our second speaker. Dr. Alexander Law holds a PhD in American history from Brandeis University, Walton, Massachusetts, and a BA, a BA in um, science from the University of the Pacific, Stockton, California. Dr. Law serves on the board of directors of the American Journal of Economics and Sociology, and she was guest editor and contributor for the January 2016 issue of the American Journal, and the title is The Politics of Urban Reform in the Golden Age and the Progressive Era, 1870 to 1920. Dr. Lau is currently the assistant editor for the annotated works of Henry George series, uh, with the ed editor Editors being Dr. Francis Peddle and Dr. William Peirce. She wrote the introductory essay in the annotated works of Henry George, Volume 3, on the condition of labor. Alex previously held the position of director of the Henry George Birthplace Archive and Historic Research South Center, Philadelphia. She lives in Southern California with her husband, Casey, and a two-year-old daughter, Riley. Alex will be talking today on the condition of labor, Henry George, Father Edward McGlynn, and the religious descent. Please welcome Dr. Alexander Lau. Some of the principles of political economy require for thorough explanation. 
So a reading of Progress and Poverty, right, George's masterwork, next to social problems, almost suggests that George maybe held back a little bit when he was writing the former, right? That an attempt to have Progress and Poverty taken seriously um, as a major work of political economy, he toned down the inherent emotionality and religiosity of his ideas. But this was certainly not the case um, with social problems and the other religious works in this volume. Uh, Professor Dossi also mentioned something that got me thinking, and I thought it would be an important point um, to, to mention here, in that at the time George is writing, he's kind of um, straddling two different worlds in terms of um, understanding how we know what we know, right? There's a epistemological shift going on about what is knowledge and how do we know what we know, right? And, and, and Ed Dodson sort of asked a question about this. George's idea of natural law, natural order, is prescriptive. It's not just descriptive, right? He believed in these, these a priori truths, right? There was truth out there that existed whether or not we believed it. Well, the whole academic community was starting to shift away from that idea. You know, it started to get infiltrated by pragmatism. And George, in some degree, was a pragmatist as well. So it was hard for the academic community, I think, to take George seriously because he kind of blended all these different disciplines, political economy, um, theology, um, sociology, which is a new discipline at the time, together. And they were trying at that time to professionalize the social sciences. And so in some ways, George was a little bit of an outsider in that regard. So I mentioned before that um, George sort of adopted the style of muckrakers at the time, and he embedded himself when he was writing social problems into the grimy underbelly of social and political life in order to shed light on the air's most pressing issues facing the country. But unlike these other muckrakers, unlike other journalists at the time, George adopted this technique in order to suggest a remedy to the issues that he was highlighting. What ties all of the works together in this volume, and really all of George's works, right, is this expression of that fundamental and ethical imperative, that desperate need for society to destroy privilege by granting universal access to the abundance of nature. Now, Social Problems demonstrates how land value taxation would stamp out many of the era's most um, prominent and worst social vices, and his religious works in this volume show how um, this remedy conformed to the fundamental tenets of Christianity. So my contribution um, to this volume three, aside from assisting um, Bill and Frank with copy editing and annotations, was the introductory essay for George's Condition of Labor. Now, this piece was published in 1891, which was the same year, and was largely in response to Pope Leo XIII's famous encyclical Rerum Novarum, which is translated into On New Things. In my essay, I argue not only that the condition of labor represented the culmination of what was a lifelong attempt by Henry George to demonstrate how his theories harmonized with religion, but also that it was a sort of last-ditch attempt to salvage the reputation and priesthood of his good friend, Father Edward McGlynn. Now, Father McGlynn, as many of you probably know, was a very popular priest of one of the largest working class parishes in New York City um, during the same time that George started to enter urban politics. He was, uh, McGlynn was inspired by Henry George's ideas and he became a soldier in the fight for economic and social justice by advocating the single tax and by actively campaigning for Henry George for mayor of New York City in 1886. In doing so, McGlynn aroused the suspicions of his superiors, particularly New York's Archbishop Michael Corrigan, who set in motion a series of disciplinary actions that led Pope Leo to excommunicate Father McGlynn and place progress of poverty on the index of forbidden books, which is <laughs> apparently a, a, an index in which you're not allowed. Good Catholics don't read these books. I'm not sure if there is still an index. Yeah. Is there? In the early 1880s, uh, before McGlynn actually um, started to actively campaign for Henry George, he had been reprimanded by the church for giving speeches in support of the Irish Land League, um, which was a political organization that was founded by Athenian activists Michael Davitt and Charles Stuart Parnell. When Corrigan became aware that Father McGlynn planned to support Henry George in the mayoral election, he ordered the priest not to give any public speeches in support of the candidate. 
when McGlynn ignored that directive, the archbishop suspended him and asked the pope to intervene by summoning McGlynn to Rome. Well, McGlynn refused multiple summons by the pope and he excommunicated him. The McGlynn controversy, as it was known at the time, was widely publicized as one of the most significant cases of American religious dissent within the, within the Catholic Church. The repercussions of McGlynn's excommunication were felt not only among the Catholic laity, but also among church leadership. McGlynn's refusal to follow Corrigan or the, the uh, Pope's dictate um, to not in, express his sort of, you know, fundamental um, uh, citizenship rights in order to be to act as a private citizen became a sort of litmus test for determining priestly appointments after the Lynn excommunication. The case also aroused anti-Catholic sentiment among Americans who had long been suspicious of Catholics' papal loyalty. According to the New York Times, the central question illuminated by the controversy was, quote, whether a man could be an adherent of the Catholic Church in full favor and an American citizen with all his rights and privileges as such untrammeled. And according to the Times, quote, until it is admitted that the jurisdiction of the church, wherever its head may be located, is limited to the domain of the spiritual and religious affair, and that man's allegiance and obedience in other manner, matters are to the institutions of his country, that answer was no. Um, can we go to the first slide here? So I know you some of these cartoons are on a flyer that, that's in your bag. Um, there were great cartoons that came out during this period of, of religious controversy and also during George's campaign for mayor in 1886. Uh, most of them appeared in Puck or Judge or Harper's. Um, this particular cartoon shows a working man, right, sort of wedged between Henry George, who's sitting at a desk, and Archbishop Michael Corgan. And, Corrigan is holding up a pastoral letter, which he, he issued and published at the height of the campaign, basically refuting many of Henry George's theories, saying that private property and land did not violate Catholic teaching or God's, uh, or God's law. So um, here he is being kind of between these two um, influences, because a, a large portion of the um, working popul population at the time was Catholic. Next slide. Um, same kind of idea here. We have Father McGlynn standing beside um, two religious figures, Henry George on one side and Pope Leo on the other. The Vatican is in the background, and I think that's sort of a castle in the clouds um, behind Henry George, maybe insinuating that his ideas are really nothing more than castles in the sky. It says castle theory on it. Yeah, castle theory, theory, castle theory in the sky. Um, now, the most vocal and active protests of McGlynn's excommunication actually came from the St. Stephen's um, 25,000 plus parishioners um, who expressed their discontent with the Pope, the Pope's decision um, really creatively actually. The first Sunday McGlynn's replacement was scheduled to give mass um, at St. Stephen's. The engineer forgot to turn on the heat and the choir, which was renowned in the city as one of the best in the, in the city, refused to sing and the donation officers decided not to hand out the collection basket. <laughs> the following week, uh, McGlynn supporters handed in special donation cards that read, good when, for 10 cents when Father McGlynn is reinstated. <laughs> <laughs> On the eve of uh, that McGlynn's excommunication was to become official, St. Stephen's parishioners took to the streets. Newspaper reports at the time estimated as many as 20,000 people came out to express their support um, for the priest, and many carried signs that said, our purses will open when our pastor is restored. Loyal Catholics, we are loyal Americans. God made the land for the people. Many of St. Stephen's parishioners continued their protests after the excommunication by becoming members of the Anti-Poverty Society, despite uh, Michael, or Archbishop Michael Corgan's um, directive not to. Henry George and Father McGlynn co-founded the Anti-Poverty Society in March 1887 to continue the work um, they felt they had started during the campaign um, to abolish poverty through what George described as, quote, the union of religious sentiment with aspiration of social reform, of the hope of heaven with the hope of banishing want and suffering from the earth. <clears throat> Our critics of Father McGlynn and George chastised the Anti-Poverty Society 
as a sham, and Corrigan ordered Catholics not to attend any of its meetings. Can we go to the next two slides here? Um, another cartoon in, oh, that one, in Puck here again, it's, it's sort of um, showing Henry George and Father McGlynn as being sort of street performers who are peddling this idea that you could abolish poverty, um, maybe preying on the uh, newcomers' dreams of the American dream, which is, I think, what McGlynn is pointing to. Um, and, and George's theories are, are shown as being sort of hot air coming out of this, this trombone. Um, next, next slide. Again, here is uh, Henry George and Father McGlynn laughing um, about the anti-poverty society as though it's just a good joke. It's just all a joke. There's nothing, no substance there. That was how it was portrayed by Puck. McGlynn's continued public activity through the anti-poverty society enraged Michael Horgan. In the fall of 1887, he wrote to the Office of the Holy See, urging it to place progress and poverty on the index of forbidden books. Now, the Pope obliged, but he instructed his bishops not to publicize the move. <laughs> Although frustrated by the Pope's demand for secrecy, Corrigan's confident Bishop Bernard McQuaid reassured the Archbishop that the issue of where the church stood in relation to the single tax would be settled for good. McQuaid wrote to Corrigan in 1889, Leo will cover in his next encyclical the whole doctrine of property as the right of ownership. This will settle George's theories. Well, despite McQuaid's assurances, Pope Leo's much-awaited encyclical made no mention of Henry George, Father Edward McGlynn, or the single tax. That said, a close reading of the text makes clear that it really aimed to address all three. Historians have long described the encyclical as a sort of watershed document that pushed the Catholic Church farther towards the progressive side of social reform. But when read in the context of the times, and particularly, the events that preceded it, Rerum Novarum is actually a rather timid defense of the status quo. While Pope Leo acknowledged and sympathized with the poor, a uh, lot of the wage labor around the world, and he chastised employers for, um, for demanding long hours under poor working conditions and not paying a good wage, he doesn't really recommend anything practical to ease their suffering. Instead, he calls on Catholics to provide more Christian charity, and workers to attend church more consistently. A good portion of the encyclical is also aimed at warning Catholics not to fall victim to the false promises of the, quote, socialists, who preach doc doctrines of ownership abhorrent to the natural order of things. The Pope's discussion of the socialists is clearly aimed at Henry George. This confl conflation of George's single tax with socialism was a frequently used strategy of his critics to avoid engaging in an honest discussion of its merits. The strategy wasn't lost on Henry George. In his lengthy reply to the Pope, George lectured His Holiness on the glaring differences between the single tax and socialists. He does good work here, but he had a lot of practice. Where the condition of labor, I think, really differs from his earlier works and speeches, and where George truly shines is his stinging critique of the Pope's defense of poverty as part of God's world and his weak plea for more charity. And so in saying that poverty is no disgrace, George writes, you convey an unreasonable implication, for poverty ought to be a disgrace, since in a condition of social justice it would imply recklessness or laziness. And if it were possible for the giving of alms to abolish poverty, George continued, there would be no poverty in Christendom. Charity is indeed a noble, and beautiful virtue, grateful to man and approved by God, but charity must be built on justice. It cannot supersede justice. The path towards justice to George and Father McGlynn was the removal of that artificial privilege of private ownership of land, which allowed a small portion of the population to extract rent from the rest for the use of resources that God had left for all. George made sure Pope Leo XIII got a copy of his letter. We don't know whether the Pope read it. We do know, however, that the Pope appeared to have a change of heart um, towards Father McGlynn. In 1892, this would just be the, the year following the publication of his encyclical and George's letter, a Catholic university, a panel of Catholic university professors um, led by a papal delegate invited McGlynn to issue a doctrinal statement in support of his reinstatement to the church. 
In the statement, McGlynn reaffirmed his commitment to Georgia's theories and demonstrated how they did not violate Catholic teaching. The panel agreed, and on December 25, 1892, Father McGlynn, as a priest, delivered Mass for the first time in more than five years. I think that's my time, so I'll end there. Yeah, well, um, we're coming back at um, um, 10.30, so, so we'll take um, seven minutes for questions, and we'll have a 10-minute break. So um, the first question is from Nick. Uh, yes, I'd like uh, to... Microphone, please. Okay. Uh, I'd like to address something which uh, Dr. Dossi said, uh, that William Graham to Sumner followed Bentham and Spencer. Now, now Jeremy Bentham, uh, I've read, described natural rights as nonsense on stilts. I've read the uh, original uh, edition of Social Statics, and uh, Spencer replied to that. He did not agree. He said, you know, why be a utilitarian and think that the uh, you, that, the, that we should have as much good for the uh, plebeian as for the patrician, or you know, the greatest good of the greatest number, whoever they are, unless the, the plebeians have rights as well. They have as much right to happiness as the patricians. S stuff like that. So whatever Spencer may have written later, uh, I think it's a little more complicated than what you said. Uh, you have studied the matter more deeply than I have. And by all means, correct me. Uh, I, I would quibble with the idea that I've studied it more thoroughly than you have. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, I, I think, think my point was um, Sumner's statement that people don't have any more rights than rights. What, what does that what does that mean? I, I think um, Sumner emphasized duties over rights. And um, our duties and uh, rights arose out of power, out of custom, out of um, those making the laws. That's a very different view than Henry George had. That that was my point. Henry George had a had a view that uh, rights um I want to Use the phrase that my good friend Bob Anderson used in his book, were imputed. Um, that is, that uh, they came from God and um, they, they were placed upon us. And so they're part of that natural, natural law. Um, so the purpose of my writing it was to, uh, or the purpose of the few words I said today, were to draw this distinction between some. Thank, thank you. Um, one more question. Um, David, David Triggs at the front. And just to let you know, I'm going to ask Alana, we've got little cards that you can write questions. There's a question period at the very end of the, the day. So Alana will give out cards, and why don't you write down the question? Um, because you might, might not remember what you were thinking about. So we've got those cards, and we'll ask those questions at the end of the day, and you can also ask questions in person. So David, please. I think the question is to both, and it relates very much to the last question, but uh, um, Alexandra used the term on one occasion, uh, privilege, and later on, artificial privilege. And it strikes me there is a very substantial difference. And I wonder if that, as it were, is deliberate, or was it just a, an accident? But it seems to me, in one sense, it's a privilege to be here. Uh, and, uh, and that's, in a sense, natural, as distinct from artificial privilege, which you em emphasized. And uh, I just wondered if you could comment on that. Uh, sure. There's a button on the bottom, the very bottom. Blue light. Yeah, it, it wasn't purposeful to say privilege and then artificial. When George is talking about um, ownership of, of natural resources, of land, um, He's saying that's artificial. 
right? That's not from God. Um, that's not part of the natural order. Um, as far as where he stood on other types of privileges, I think we could go on. But um, in terms of private property and land, it's artificial. It's good. Yeah. We've got one very, one more question, very short question, if um, we could. I think just I just wanted to say privilege in Henry George's day was a contraction of private legislation. It did not mean what it means today. I think we've got a question. Well, thank you. All right. Thank you for your talk, both the views and good morning. Um, this is really for Dr. Dawson. It's it's a question that I've seen the actions of others that have made the difference. So. I'm asking you this question. Has the church over time has left the position to help to support and support the poor and the needy and have kept the offerings to build their own growth? And I'm not saying for all churches. I'm just leaving the weight and, and leaving the weight on the government to do their part in the life that had uh, been uh, brought before us under Christ. Is this one? Um, it is. Uh, uh, thank you for asking asking that, and that's a question close to my heart, as you can you can imagine. And um, it's going to be part of the subject I want to take up in a few minutes when um, we have a second session. But um, the, the way way I think of Christianity is of this um, massive river like a huge river. Maybe it goes back to the time when I was a, a, uh, a young person in South America and we'd go fishing on the Paraná and that Paraná River, it's a huge river. It borders Bolivia and Paraguay and comes on down to Argentina. Go, goes on out to the estuary south of Uruguay. So it sets that border. We go, go fishing there. And um, some 700 miles longer than the Mississippi uh, with a with a flow of water, much greater. Uh, a basin that's um, uh, 1.2 million square miles, a huge river. And I think of Christianity as something like that. And as you go, go on the river, you know, there, there's deep water and a lot of currents and all. There are, diff there are over 30,000 denominations in Christianity, over 30,000 over um, 1.3 uh, uh, billion or 2.3 billion Christians in the world. So there's a sense in which it's hard to categorize Christianity, isn't it? But you look for those deep, deep water currents and sometimes, of course, it overflows the bank. <coughs> Rain, rainy season there on the Paraná. It overflows the bank and go for miles and miles back. And I think sometimes Christianity gets, get out, gets out of its bank. You know, All right. You know, off into the marshes, I'd say. Okay. But one of the deep currents in Christianity, I think, is this social responsibility. I don't think you can read the Bible from cover to cover, read it continuously, as I kind of have a habit of doing, meditate about that, and just not see that. Does the church sometimes forget there are other currents in Christianity, too? A lot of currents. You know, there's pietism and orthodoxy and all sorts of currents. But I think it does, it does sometimes, there are Christian groups that forget that deep water current. But I, I think it's there, it's always there. The church will always come back to it, uh, the church. You know, the essence of Christianity will come back to it. Thank you very much. Well, friends, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to uh, thank Alex and James for their presentation. Um, we, we're going to have uh, Fred Baldry on, but we had a poor connection. But uh, Fred... We had a good connection. We ran out of time. We, um, we, unfortunately, we can't have um, um, Fred, Fred with us, but he did write a very interesting um, article, commentary on the three speeches, um, in what on Moses, and uh, that is in the annotated works, and it's a very good thing for, for, for you to read. So we'll wrap up, we'll take a 10-minute break, and um, we're coming back 
uh, at 10.30 with Ethics, Morality and the Land Question, Charles Avila. Thank you very much indeed.